Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to welcome you to our service here at St. George's, our service of Holy Communion. And if you're joining with us by means of YouTube, then it's lovely to have you along with us in that way as well. And um, this afternoon, we're continuing our series uh, in the letter to, of James. But we're going to begin our service by uh, reminding ourselves that we come here um, entirely by God's grace. He welcomes us in to his kingdom and he welcomes us to his table here this afternoon. And so our first hymn is Only by Grace Can We Enter. <laughs> Please be seated. And as we come together in God's presence, we say these words together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we come into God's presence, uh, we come because of his grace, not because of anything we do, because in uh, just about every way we fall short of God and of his standards. So we come together, first of all, as we ask the forgiveness of our sins. So let us admit to God the sin which always confronts us. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us 
and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And hear these words of absolution. May the Father forgive you by the death of his Son and strengthen you to live in the power of his Holy Spirit all your days. Amen. And Barbara's going to come and read the passage from well, the next bit from the letter of James. Faith and deeds. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you, one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You will believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor, Abraham, considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You'll see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in different directions. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we're going to look at that passage in just a minute or two. But before we do that, we're going to sing our next hymn, which is Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
Please would you be seated? And if I can ask you please to turn back to that passage in James, um, page 1,224, one, sorry, t- 1,214, I beg your pardon, 1214, um, James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. And um, as you know by now, these are the reasons why we are looking at the letter of James. Because first of all, uh, James has a lot to teach us about Jesus, because he was his brother. So I guess he knew him pretty well. Uh, He was also, as we saw last week, he was the leader of a local church. So last week, uh, last time we looked at the letter of James, we looked at one of the issues that was plaguing the churches to which he was writing, the, the issue of social snobbery, where, where people are on the social scale. Uh, and the third reason that we are looking at the letter of James is because James is a wise leader. Uh, he has a lot to teach us. Uh, he has wisdom, the wisdom of the Christian life to teach us, does James. And today, the passage today probably does fit under that heading there. Uh, James has wisdom to teach us. Uh, the wisdom that he wants to pass on to us uh, is the wisdom of faith. And as we'll see as we go through shortly, the wisdom of how faith relates to actions, faith and deeds. But the first thing that James wants to teach us in this passage is faith. What is faith? I mean, we talk a lot about faith and I mean, after all, as Christians, faith is what we do. But what is it? How are we meant to understand it? Um, If you look at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? What is faith? How do you get faith right? How do you understand it? Um, Is faith... Like this. Is faith like, to use the slightly fancy language, <laughs> is it an assent to a proposition? <laughs> is it, an ass- you know, just saying something is true, uh, like two and two and four is true? L- like a tick box. Um, faith is like something like a tick box. Two and two is four. Six divided by three is two. Two times four is eight. Tick, tick, tick. Is that what faith is? Or is it something else completely? Is it more like uh, a life-changing experience? Is that what faith is? A life-changing experience. A bit like falling in love. A bit like when Neil Armstrong um, descended the steps onto the moon and put his foot on the lunar surface, a step into a new world. Is that what faith is? Well, in this passage, James says to us, it is both. It is both here, it's actually coming to see that things, certain things are really true, and it's here. Uh, faith becomes part of our experience, our, our whole experience of life. Um, faith does involve believing in certain things that are true. It, it, is, it is an assent to a proposition, <laughs> in part at least. Believing certain things are true. Look at verse, look at verse 19. You believe that there is one God, good, Even the demons believe that and shudder. So you have to believe something. You have to believe that. You have to believe there is only one God. And and bless them, the uh, early church fathers uh, extrapolated on that one verse for you. Uh, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Faith involves believing that those things are true. They are real. They are true. Faith involves believing that these things tell you the truth. They tell you the truth about God. 
They tell you the truth about Jesus. They tell you the truth about life, the universe and everything. And they tell you the truth about you as a human being. And when we, say, oops, when we say these things are true, we do not mean they are true for me. They are simply true for me. No, these are true for everybody. Even, even the demons. <laughs> it's true for them. It's true for the ones who want to reject it completely and push it away. It's still true. Uh, what we claim as truth, what we believe as truth as Christians, is true for everybody. It's true for us in here. It's true for them in the pub, across the road. It's true for them sitting their own watching, oh, what are they watching? Love Island? Are they watching Love Island? I don't know, whatever they're watching. It, tennis, yeah. <laughs> Wimbledon, yeah. It's true for them. All of this is true. It is possible to push it away and ignore it. It's possible even to deny it, as, as the demons do. But it's still true. It's still real. It's still life, the universe, and everything. So that's the first thing about faith. It, it does involve assent to propositions, assent to truth. But faith never simply resides there. Faith is also belief in action. Look at verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith is a life-changing thing. Um, faith makes a journey, if it is real faith, if it is true faith, it makes a journey of about, what's that, about 12 inches or so? But it's the longest journey in the world, from head to heart. Uh, faith is a life-changing experience. Faith alters the way you see the world, and it alters the way that you live in the world. So faith, real faith, is both head and heart. It is both believing that something is true, and then acting in the light of of that belief. And we'll look at some examples of that uh, in, in, in a minute or two. But that's what faith is. Um, and the wisdom that James has for us in this passage about faith, the, the, the reason why he's writing this little bit of his letter, is this relationship here. This is the wisdom that he wants us to learn because it is crucially important. It was crucially important for these people to whom he was writing. It's crucially important for every one of us, every generation of Christians, to understand this relationship. The wisdom that he has to teach us is the wisdom of how faith relates to deeds, how faith relates to works, how faith relates to good, the good works that belong to the Christian life. And in particular, what James is exploring in this passage is the relationship, which one comes first? Which one comes first? Faith or works? Do works come first? Do I have to, as a Christian, tot up so many, so many brownie points until I get to a point where my faith is good enough for God. Is, is, that, is that what it is? I, I do this, I do this, I do this. And I get to a point when somehow my faith is good enough for God. Bang. Is that how it works? Um, well, if it works like that, we are all in serious trouble. Because how much is enough? How do I know when I've done enough? Uh, there have been people who have read this part of the letter of James and they have thought that that is exactly what James was saying. They thought he was saying in all of this that if you do this, if you build up the brownie, you have to build up so many brownie points and only then will you be good enough. And here's one person who thought that. 
This guy here, Martin Luther. Uh, if you look at verse 24, I, if you don't know who Martin Luther is, I'll explain him to you in a minute. But this is, this is if you look at verse 24, verse, Luther misunderstood this verse. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. And, and, and he thought, Luther thought, that what James was saying is you've got to build the brownie points up. And only when you've built them up sufficiently far, then you'll be good enough for God. Your faith will be good enough for God. Um, and Luther disliked that so strongly, uh, he called the letter of James an epistle of straw. <laughs> An epistle of straw. In other words, fit for just chucking out the window. But um, Martin Luther was a German theologian. Uh, Martin Luther launched the Reformation of the 16th century that swept through Europe and changed the world, literally. But, and whisper this very quietly, um, if you're watching in Germany, you might want to just plug your ears at this point. So if you listen in Germany, switch the sound off. Luther got it wrong. <laughs> Luther got it wrong. He didn't read the passage properly. <laughs> um, James, if you're in Germany, you can switch the, switch the sound on, that's it. But you can switch it back on again, that's fine. Uh, James, in this passage, does not say that. He's making a completely different point altogether to what Luther thought he was saying. If you want to understand what James is saying here, if you want to understand that relationship between faith and good works, it goes something like that. Faith works and not the basis for faith. Works, good works, are instead the fruit of faith. Um, if you look at verse 22, verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And if you think of a tree, Think about the bough of a tree. The tree is anchored to the ground by its roots. If you take the roots away, the tree falls over. The roots of the tree are faith. By faith, we are rooted in Jesus Christ. By faith, we are anchored to Jesus Christ. If you take faith away, the whole thing topples over. Faith is like the root of a tree. But these trees, apple, peach, lemon, orange, wooden cherry, these trees produce a fruit. How do you know the tree is alive? It produces fruit. And just as Christians we are anchored in Jesus Christ by the root of faith, then that root of faith should produce fruit in our lives. It should produce the fruit of good works in our lives. Our faith should change our life. Works are a fruit of faith. Um, that's how it goes. Faith first, the fruit of which is works. If you get it the wrong way around, you are in serious, serious trouble. Because how many works do you have to do? If you get it the right way around, then that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, the f faith will lead to a fruit in your life. Um, and in this passage, James gives two examples 
of people who got this right. Two examples from the Old Testament, two biblical examples of people who got this right, whose faith changed their lives, whose faith led to their actions. And, well, let's see, there's one man and there's one woman and they're pretty stark examples as well. <laughs> two people who got it right. And it's a good job they did get it right. Uh, first example that James talks about in this passage is the example of Abraham. Faith in action. Abraham, listen to this. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Genesis chapter 22. God says to Abraham, see your son, your only son, whom you love. Take him to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice on the altar that you'll find there. That's a heck of a proof of faith, isn't it? That's a heck of a way for faith to lead to action. And, of course, I'm sure you know the story. As Abraham was about to plunge the knife in... God said to him, no, I will provide the sacrifice. And, and there was a lamb caught in the bushes, which Abraham used instead. But there's faith in action. That's a heck of an action, isn't it? Um, that's a heck of a fruit in the life of Abraham. The second person who got it right, whose faith led to action, whose faith produced a fruit is a woman it's this lady here Rahab uh, verse 25 and she's an interesting example of somebody who got it right in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction Rahab wasn't a nice person. Rahab was a lady of the night, a woman of ill repute. But she had faith. She understood that God intended the Israelites to enter the promised land. And when the spies came in fear of their lives, she hid them on her roof. Her faith produced a fruit. Her faith led to action. And I suppose what Rahab demonstrates, I suppose what Rahab demonstrates is that anybody can believe. Anybody from any kind of background can believe. Um, faith can come to anyone and if it leads to action, if it leads to fruit in that person's life, then that faith is genuine. And the question I think that James wants to leave with us, that the question, well, the question I'm going to leave with you, and, and, and I think this is what James would say to you if he was here today, the question that from this passage is the question of verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. How has faith changed our lives? Because James says it must change in some way. Because if it hasn't, then it's fit only for the mortuary. How has faith changed our lives? Um, how has it changed us as a person? Has it, has it made us um, kinder, more patient? Uh, has it given us courage to face the difficult things in life in a way that we couldn't before? Has it changed our ambitions? Has it changed our plans? Has it altered our scale of values? Uh, in what way has it done that? Because it, it has to do it because 
It's like the body without the spirit. It's like a tree that no longer produces fruit. It must, in some way, change us. How has faith changed you? How has faith altered you in your life today? Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that it speaks to us, the way that it comes to us, and for the way that it changes our lives. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us and all that you want to do in us and through us. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, as we think of these words of the creed, or at least the question and answer form of the creed, shall we stand as we come to them? Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? We Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God, and makes Christ known in the world. We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So please will you be seated as we come to our intercession. Let us pray. And let us pray this evening for um, all in authority, for the governments of the world, as all these things are responsible ultimately to God himself. Heavenly Father, we pray for our own country at this time of political change and instability. We pray for Boris Johnson, that he would, look, he would find support that he would find wise counsel at this time. And we ask that he might look to you for direction in his life. We pray for those who would seek to follow him as the next Prime Minister. We pray that they would serve with honesty and integrity. And we pray for all members of Parliament that they would find the wisdom and courage to confront the social, political, economic and cultural problems that face us as a country at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And looking overseas, we now pray for the governments of Japan and America who have seen their own recent troubles. Lord God, we pray for Japan at this time in the light of the assassination of their former Prime Minister, which tragically took place this week and we pray for the United States of America as they too have seen division, upheaval and violence. We pray for the peace and well-being of these countries and we pray for their unity as they seek to move forwards. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we near the end of the school year, let's pray now for our own church school down the road at the Ellis School in Hemingfield. And we pray for Mrs. Herding as she takes up a new post and for Mrs. Edwards as she takes over the responsibilities of the head teacher. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Ellis School, for its staff and its children. We thank you for the work that Mrs. Herding has done as head teacher there over the last few years. And we thank you for the way that she has nurtured both the children and the staff to give their best. We pray that you would bless her in her new school. And we pray for Mrs. Edwards, that you'd equip her with all the gifts that she needs in her new role. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray, uh, rather if you'd like to pray your own prayers at this time, if there's uh, anyone or any situation, that you'd like to offer to God, then just take a moment to do that.
And let's pray especially for John, John Potts, and also for Teresa. We commit them into God's hands at this time. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Um, just to say by way of notices, if you didn't get one of these last week, please make sure you get one as you leave tonight. It's got all of the um, notices for over the summer, what we're planning to do over the summer. And uh, on the inside, there's a notice about a picnic that we'll have next Sunday morning after the service at St Mary's. So if you want to come for 12 o'clock to the rectory, then please come along and bring your own food. Uh, but we will supply drinks and ice cream. Uh, we also say, if it rains, we have space for an indoor picnic. <laughs> well, rain would be a fine thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> but we, we, are look, we are looking at getting a, a big, what is it? A, a, a big gazebo sun shade. Yeah, we're getting an even bigger gazebo, so we will provide you with a little bit of space to get out of the sun. Um, and also I remind you next week it is our family service which will be at 4 o'clock not 5 o'clock but the family service next week will be at 4pm so please do come along to that 4pm but I think that's all I need to say other than to say we're going to sing our communion hymn which is, no we're not, we're going to do the peace sorry, sorry <laughs> I, I, one part of the service I always forget is the peace shall we stand as we come to the peace Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. And while we're doing that, we will sing our communion hymn, which is When I Survey. Thank mm -hmm. you.
So please be seated. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your son, Jesus Christ, to be our saviour. He's dying and rising has set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine out poured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine, Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Christ is the bread of life. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. And as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you. And his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith. With thanksgiving. And we say together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, 
and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. We say together the prayer after communion. 
Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. And our closing hymn as we prepare to go out and put our faith into action, into practice, then we need God's help. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life in you. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.